Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, everyone. My name is B, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I'm also... Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Before I get into my favorite topic, which is myself, I, uh, I want to thank you, Didi, for inviting me here and for your patience with all my indecision about whether I could be here or not. Um, I am so grateful. I'm also so grateful to Anne W. and John, her husband, for taking good care of me while I've been here. And I'm particularly thrilled to be in the presence of so many women and men that I've known for a long, long time. And I'm just wondering why you'd want to be here this morning. So uh, just feel free to take a little break and fall asleep, especially those of you who have been dancing all night. Um, Anyway, I just want to tell you that um, I'm here to share with you my experience, strength, and hope, and the gratitude that I wish to express to you for being once again having the honor of being in your beautiful islands here. Uh, My life was wonderful until I was two. uh, You can see with these very glaring lights that are here that this is going to be a long meeting if I tell you my experience, strength, and hope. Um, What happened for me when I was two was that my little sister was born, and uh, she moved into my spot, which was the center of the universe for two years. And if I had my brothers, I would like that to be the same way today, if you know what I mean. Um, and and she, she just, it just felt like that my whole world fell apart when she moved in there. And then these Irish Catholic parents that I have her had kept on having babies every year. And there were five of us in the end. And um, it was just that every time a new baby was born, I felt like that I was being pushed to the edge of this family. Now... Some of you, especially those of you who might be new, might be wondering why I'd be telling you stuff like this. And I I always like to refer to our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is what I live by or try to live by today. And those of you who know the book well, and I know many of you here do, uh, you'll, you'll remember that on page 64 it says that alcohol really is not our problem. That was baffling to me when I got into Alcoholics Anonymous. What it it says there is that our job is to get down to the causes and conditions of what happened for us. And so this family, you know, kind of uh, made me feel like I didn't fit somewhere in there. And um, a very tragic thing happened in the family when I was eight years old. My father went to work one day and he was killed accidentally by a tree falling on top of him in the forest in Ireland. And uh, what I remember most about that whole event was that on the day of his funeral, my mother called me aside, and she said, B, I want you to help me to raise these children. And I remember putting away all my toys, my dolls, and my playthings, and starting about this business called growing up. Now... Fortunately or unfortunately, I have a lot of people who have known me from my very early sobriety, and particularly one woman called Marilyn. And she has been sentenced to secrecy, that she would not tell anybody how ungrown up I was almost 25 years ago. And those of you who know me currently know that I have the capacity to be very emotionally immature even these days sometimes. I know nobody in this room will identify with that, but just wanted to be current like my sponsor advises me to be on a regular basis. And so um, I started about this business of growing up, and uh, as I said, it hasn't quite happened yet, 
But I do know that if I stick around with you, that there's a real possibility that this could happen, at least to some degree. And uh, I, my mother, she was a school teacher, and she raised the five of us all by herself and did everything for us and was very intense on the fact that we should all be educated because I think she thought we would all be widowed at 32 like she was. And um, started about, you know, really teaching us how to, to be self-sufficient, <laughs> uh, which has stood me in good stead in many ways, but uh, when I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, I had to unlearn an enormous amount of material that I was instructed in in my youth. In fact, my mother um, sort of, she emanated the, the, the sentence, I think it's on page 61, is she not a victim of the delusion? that she can wrest satisfaction out of this world if she only manages well. And I thought that my job in life was to manage well. So when I got into my teenage years, I did what most of us do in those years. I started thinking about what I would want to be doing with the rest of my life. So I decided to become a saint. It always amazes me that somebody gets up here prior to my speaking and they read out of this book and it says, we are not saints. Uh, That hurt my feelings terribly when I got into Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, um, perfectionism was one of the things that I was really uh, interested in for a long time. And so in, in trying to become a saint, what I decided to do was to become a Catholic nun. And I've been doing Catholic nunnyhood for 53 years. <laughs> and um, thank you. And it always amazes me why you'd want to be spending a Sunday morning with a Catholic nun, you know. Um, because I know there's quite a percentage of you here in these chairs who have resentment against somebody like me. I know that. I'm really aware of that. And I just want to say this, that um, I didn't do it to you. Okay. By the same token, by the same token though, I want to say that if there's any woman or man in this assembly today who has ever been hurt or punished or humiliated by anybody in my line of work or in the church to which I belong, I sincerely and humbly ask your forgiveness in the name of that institution. Because one of the things... One of the things I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is that there are assholes every place. There are uh, Catholic assholes, Baptist assholes, Presbyterian assholes, Lutheran assholes, some Jewish assholes. And um, in some countries that I have visited, I have met a couple of assholes in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, you may, and I'm not sure about Al-Anon yet. But what I want to say is that, you know, all institutions, are human and they make human mistakes and it was interesting to me that the Pope has been going around the world recently telling everybody how sorry he is about the problems in the Catholic Church and I think that he has heard that I've been doing this too so he just thought he'd better better get with the program here so uh, I started into this on the 16th of July 1950 And uh, I have loved my vocation and my life ever since. And I never planned in my script to be an alcoholic. Uh, It was never part of what I thought was going to happen. 
And uh, I went through the early years, the early training years, my novitiate, as it was called. And then they sent me over to England to finish my education. And I graduated from the University of London and did well. I was teaching in England and very happy with myself. Loved teaching, loved opening children's minds and having fun. And it was just, seemed like it was wonderful. And somewhere in there, and I can't tell you exactly the moment or the time or the space in which it happened, but a strange little voice entered my brain. And it went something like this. If only they would shape up, I would feel better. If I could just get everybody to do it the way I think it ought to be done, which is the way I think it should be done, then I would be fine. Now, it didn't matter who they were. Um, it could be anybody. It could be the parents of the children with whom uh, I was involved every day. It could have been the rest of the community in which I was living. It could be the government. It could be anybody. But this voice persisted. And a, a really great thing happened one day. I came home from school and uh, was informed that our superiors back in Ireland were asking for volunteers to go to California. And of course, I used to be a compulsive volunteer, so and besides which I knew that I belonged in Hollywood, so I <laughs> thought, well, I'm going to put my name down and volunteer to go to this place and um, call California. And so I signed up, and they picked me. And on the day that I was leaving, I had to go back to Ireland to do all my paperwork and all of that. And on the day I was leaving, my superior tapped me on the shoulder and she said to me, Sister, we're going to put you in charge. <laughs> and I knew that I had arrived. <laughs> I just knew that I had arrived because I knew if I was in charge, then I could get it all to work the way it was supposed to work. This thing called life. And so I arrived in Southern California in mid-August of 1964 and um, draped in the long habit. I wore my long habit for those of you who are recovering Catholics and who haven't gotten over it yet. Um, <laughs> You know, it was long black serge with white starch all over here. And all you could see was our faces and our two hands. And it was very hot in California in mid-August. But I didn't care too much about that. It didn't worry me so much because I knew that it was going to be okay because I was in charge. I was in <laughs> charge of the school, in charge of the nunny bunnies, all the, lots of them all running around, you know, with lots of them in those days. And it just seemed that my life was beginning to shape up and I was going to be fine. And then a few days from that, when I settled in and unpacked and saw the whole situation, and um, I met this man, and he was called the pastor. And he had the notion that he was in charge. <laughs> I just can never figure out where he got that because I knew that I had been given this job to do. And immediately we started to lock horns and to not do very well together. Now, in those days, I was extraordinarily nunny. Now, if you don't know what that is, let me try to show you from here what it looks like. You smile a lot and you say, screw you. <laughs> I think, I think it's called passive aggressive behavior, you know. <laughs> but I smiled a lot, and I did the best I could, and I bounced around this and tried to get this to work, and tr planned his demise on a number of occasions, <laughs> and planned writing letters to the bishop, and oh dear, I was really wanted to get him out of my life so that I could get on with the job I was going to be doing, which was being in charge. And he didn't know really that much about what my line of work was, but he thought he did. And, oh, it was really difficult. And, of course, since I wanted to project a good image, I was big into impression management in those days. And um, 
I didn't want to let the nanny bunny see how terrible this would be if I fought with him, and I didn't want him to think that I couldn't do this, and I didn't want anyone to know. And it was very confusing. A marvelous thing happened one day. A marvelous thing happened. And what happened was a lady who had her kids in the school came to my office door, and she said, would you like to have all the sisters come over and swim at our swimming pool this evening? And we said, of course. We piled all the nanny bunnies into the station wagon, went over to her house. We had a great swim. All finished the swimming. We're sitting at the side of her pool, and she walked out her patio door with this big tray and this large pitcher and these glasses with salt on the top. <laughs> oh. She poured this beverage into the glass and she handed it to me and I took a large draft of this. I never was a sipper, as I'm sure you will understand, some of you. <laughs> and I took a large draft of this and I had my first and best spiritual awakening of my entire life. And I knew that I must have died and that I went straight to heaven. And that I just thought, this is wonderful. And uh, we had a, a lovely, lovely evening there. And when, <laughs> when we were leaving, I said to her, could you please give us the recipe to take home? So she gave us the recipe, and since I was in charge, I just thought the nicest thing that I could do on a really regular basis for these nunny bunnies who worked so hard, because they worked for me, uh, was to whip this up regularly so that they would relax a little bit, you know. And I would say to them, are you tired? And they'd say, oh God, we're exhausted, you know. <laughs> they were around me all the time, so they're exhausted. And they'd say, yeah, we just have had report cards. We've just had parent-teacher conferences. And I would say, well, let's, let's just celebrate this evening. Now, my notion, I thought celebrate was a really liturgical term. You know, I, 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 I never did say, let's get drunk this evening. <laughs> I just wanted to kind of have this spirit of camaraderie of where we'd sort of kick back and we'd have our little drinky poo, you know, I just thought it was the nicest thing. There was a thing happening in our church at the time, some of you would identify with this, it was called Vatican II, when that little roly-poly pope that there was at the time, he went to the Vatican window and he said, let's pull the drapes back and get some fresh air in here for God's sake. And I thought he meant that we could drink. Just, I really, just, I did. I thought he meant loosen up, you know, just be a little bit more human and have a little drinky poo for yourself, you know? <laughs> I had no idea it was about changing your heart or changing your mind about things or all that. I, I just didn't get it, you know. I just thought it was about being a little bit more human and being more human was to have a drink, I thought. And um, one of the things I noticed at a very early time in my drinking career, and that was that these nunnies did not drink like me. They, they would say things like, let's, let's have the little glasses. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that I was never interested in anything little. It, it always was big, you know, huge, large, like a, a big flower pot full of booze would have been fine for me. And, and then they would sit with their little finger like this, you know, and they would sip. They were so boring to drink with, you know. Oh. And they never finished it. I just thought that was a terrible sin, you know, not to, not to finish. And I just couldn't, I, I, I couldn't quite understand why they didn't, go, you know, just drink it fast and get more. And, and I was always watching to see, you know, how I could get my next one. And how could I get this happen again? And when I was drinking a drink, I could never enjoy that one because I was always wanting the thing to, to reoccur. It was, oh, the struggle. The struggle was incredible. The, the mental energy I had to use to make this happen on a regular basis was, was terrible. But, but what I want to say is that if anybody here is interested in continuing to drink, and I hope you're not, don't ever drink with nuns. They'll drive you crazy. <laughs> they will. 
one of my favorite places to drink was Mexico, and I probably met some of you there, but we didn't meet until now, so I'm pleased to meet you today. Uh, there was a fellow who, who we knew, he and his wife had a, a trailer down in Estero Beach, which was about a two hour, two hour and a half drive from where I live. And one day he said to me, you know, we hardly ever use this any longer, and if you ever wanted to have a long weekend or a bit of a break, work so hard, oh God, I worked so hard, so that I could have my reward. And he said, why don't you take advantage of this place, it's beautiful, it's right by the water, and he came over to the convent one day and he handed me the keys. And he, he held them up to me and he said, this is the key of the front door, this is the key of the cabana. And then he held up a little key, and he said, Sister, this key is the key of the liquor cabinet. Help yourselves. And I said, Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> I did. And I said to the nanny bunnies, You know what? Pretty soon we will have to be teaching Spanish in uh, Southern California. <laughs> so we better get down to Mexico as often as we can so that we can learn how to speak Spanish. With all the Canadians and Americans who are down in Estero Beach, by the way. But, uh, you know, you don't know. You don't know you're in denial. So every long holiday, short holiday, long weekend, short weekend, any time we could get a break at all, we would pile into this big station wagon. All nanny bunnies had station wagons in those days. And we would go down to Mexico. And sometimes they would say to me, do you think we should be drinking his booze? And I would say, well, we're eating his cereal, aren't we? <laughs> and we wouldn't want to hurt his feelings. <laughs> I was really in, intent on not hurting his feelings. And uh, my drinking career started. I could stand here for a long time today and tell you some of the terrible escapades that I experienced. But what I want you to know is that uh, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to share you know what it used to be like and what it used to be like was hell for me because it was so lonely and I often fantasize even these days and think where were some of you when I was drinking you know I think we could have had a ball you know <laughs> I mean my little Judy A who's somewhere down there and a couple of you that have the same sort of years of sobriety that I have Jim T and all of you you know, we could have had some good fun together, all of us. And I was here all lonely trying to figure this thing out, you know. How could I manage to control and enjoy my drinking? And what it tells us in chapter 3, as we well know, is that this is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker, that somehow, someday, we'll be, we'll be able to get this thing down and that we'll be able to control and enjoy our drinking. We're hoping that this is going to happen. And so, when it wasn't happening for me, I got extremely careful. And, and I, I knew that if I drank and drove, that I would be caught. I knew that that would happen. And that my name would be all over the Los Angeles Times, and I would disgrace the community. And I was all oh, just in a terrible state about this. And I knew that if I drank on the job, somebody would smell it, and then I'd be in disgrace also. So I tried for years to do a variety of things so that I would be able to do this thing called controlling and enjoying. Now, one of the things that I did, and Tony mentioned it yesterday, I was so delighted about this because I, I never heard anyone saying this before, was I tried Est. I don't know if any of you did this, uh, you know, Est thing. It was in the 60s, 70s. And what I remember most about Est, Tony, and I don't know that you mentioned this yesterday, was that you went for these two long weekends, you know, this intensive to find out who in the heck you were anyway. I hadn't a clue. And... Um, what I remember the most about that was that you were told you could not drink in between the weekends. And that was like a death sentence for me. But I tried Est, and I tried reading more psychology books. I tried doing more theology, got several degrees on God. And if there's anybody here who had the same ideas I had, you see, I thought because I had given my life to God, I wear this ring on my finger that says that I belong to God, you know, I became Mrs. God at a very early age. I just, you know, I just thought that 
I had this thing down, you know, and that a little drinky poo here in between wouldn't hurt anybody, especially me and God, you know. So what was wrong with this? Couldn't I just get it down that I wouldn't be involved, as it says in the doctor's opinion, with the phenomenon of craving alcohol? I just thought that it would be important that I, that I could get this thing, you know. And I, another thing I tried to do was I tried to pray. And I remember one of the things I did was I made a 30-day retreat in Northern California with a specific um, intention of praying that somehow I would be able to have a little drink and not be craving it at 2 o'clock in the morning and not wanting to, to find places where I could drink. And I, I was hoping that I could get this thing off my back, the tyranny of my obsession to drink alcohol. And what I recall about that 30-day retreat was we prayed for hours. It was a silent retreat. We fasted. And on the 15th day, the retreat director told us that we could have a free day. That meant that we could go out, we could talk to one another, and we could go out and see some things in in that area. And the other people who lived close to there said to me, is there any place special you would like to go since you live in Southern California? And I said, yes, I would like to go and visit the Napa Valley. (laughs) I just thought I was being very cultural, you know, and that I was adding to a cultural experience. And so we went to visit the Napa Valley, and we went into all the wineries and um, had a a little taste of what they had to offer in those godforsaken tiny little glasses, you know, (laughs) God's spirit. And I can remember coming back to that retreat center that evening and dying to drink more, but knew that I had 15 more days to go. And uh, on the 30th day of that retreat, I was very thirsty. You see, what I learned and what I can say now, which I didn't know then, was that God and I, God and I, just by ourselves, could get me sober. But God and I just by ourselves could never keep me sober. I needed to have people like you. I needed to have people like you in my life so that I could learn something about what was going on for me. And I could learn about the tremendous grace that I've been given to be involved in such a magnificent program as, as Alcoholics Anonymous. What a gift. But what I want to say is that I died inside And as you sit here in this huge audience, you know, it's interesting always just to think of your moment, the moment where you knew that you had to get some help. I don't know where most of you were, if you were in an accident or if you were in a hospital or if somebody did an intervention on you or what, but I want you to know that I was standing in our convent in a, a very sheltered place, a peaceful place, a good place with good people. And I was dying inside. And I did not know who to talk to, who to speak to, who to tell this big secret I had that I couldn't stay stopped drinking. And I was standing in our living room. We call it the community room. And I just, at random, walked over to the bookshelf and picked up this little book, almost like an accident. It was a little periodical that's uh, published for our sisters. It's called Sisters Today. And on the very back page, there was an ad. And the ad said, Sister, are you concerned about your drinking? If so, call this number, collect. So um, it was um, 9 o'clock at night. And I made a collect call to Massachusetts. It was midnight their time. And it was in the days where you could get a real live voice, a human voice on the phone. Before the days of press one and then listen to music and press two and get it in another language and then get the menu repeated. Now, if this had happened for me, I would have hung up. I just know I would have. And um, a real live voice came on the phone. It was a woman. And I told her that I was very concerned about other people's drinking. (laughs) I'm sure none of you have ever told any lies. 
but uh, I didn't know what to do. I, this part was true. I was moving from that job that I had in the school, as principal of the school, to a, a big, elated job in the diocese. It was supposed to be very prestigious. I just thought, well, you know, I should find out how to... Uh, how to, st- how, how to get other people to stop drinking, and then maybe if I could find that out, I could find out what way I could do that. So I told her all these big long lies, and uh, oh, impressed her about all my degrees and how smart I was and all that. And, and then she said to me, Sister, would you like to tell me a little bit about your own drinking? Um, because I don't know that you would be calling collect at midnight if you're just um, <laughs> thinking about other people. I have the greatest respect for all of you people from the East Coast who are here. You're very smart. Uh, And then she said, um, because I can hear pain in your voice. When she said that to me, I broke down into the phone and I cried bitterly and sobbed and she didn't know one word I said, I know, but she said, don't hang up, honey, don't hang up, just stay right there, you're going to be okay, and I, <gasps> I told her how smart I was, and how I never did this, and never did that, and oh God, oh, please don't get me wrong, and oh, and then she said, it might be a good idea for you to think about this, she said, you know, it's kind of like getting off the elevator at any floor you want, but you may not be ready to do that. Now, you tell an Irish woman that she's not ready, and then she'll tell you that she is ready, and she'll prove it to you that she's ready. And um, she said it would be a good thing for you, perhaps, to go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and um, listen to the similarities instead of to the differences. Now, prior to this, she had promised me that she would send me literature and facilities, names of facilities that I could get help for all these other people that I was concerned about. But she told me that it would be a good thing for me to go to an AA meeting and listen to the similarities instead of to the differences. Now, I didn't have a clue what that really meant, but um, the following morning I called Alcoholics Anonymous in Whittier, which was quite a little distance from where I lived. And what I remember most about that meeting was a Wednesday morning was that, um, well, first of all, we were wearing a kind of a modified nunny habit, so I decided not to go to AA in that. So um, I took that off and put on some regular clothes and found this uh, cheap eye makeup and put it on my eyes and looked gorgeous 25 years ago. I went to uh, this place in Whittier, oh God, I know Kimberly and Marilyn and a whole bunch of you know where this is, uh, in Serenity Hall in Whittier. Now Serenity Hall in those days is not the Serenity Hall that's there now because after the earthquake it was no longer able to stand. But this Serenity Hall was on Greenleaf Avenue in Whittier and I went in there and I will never forget my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I need to tell you about this because it was extremely significant and I just thought I could never go back. Um, There was a podium, somewhat like this, and the serenity prayer was draped on the front here. And um, it seemed to me, now this may not even be true, but this is what my perception was at my first AA meeting, that there were little old men shuffling all over Serenity Hall. No. And there were two women. One uh, left, and the other one stayed. Now, the one who stayed was, as we say in Ireland, she was not the full shilling. She was... <laughs> she was laughing at the wrong time, and clapping at the wrong time, or as they would say in, in Southern California, you know, one taco short of a combination plate. You know, she's just way out there. And these little old man, you know, and this, oh, there was loads of smoke. The smoke came right down to here. You know, you could, oh, and there were these big couches in the front lines. Marilyn, you remember those? The couches, I thought, God, these are full of fleas, I bet, you know. And I was just so scared in there. It was awful. And I was sitting, sitting there with my green eye makeup and all this stuff. And um, 
Then there was a fellow at the podium. Now, if you're new, you don't know a lot of these things. See, you think that the, whoever's at the podium is in charge of Alcoholics Anonymous, the president or whatever. So I just think he must be the head guy of all this place or whatever. And he's standing at the podium and he's sharing his experience, strength, and hope with us. He was fascinating to me because he was using words with great ease that I was not accustomed to hearing on a regular basis. Like he, he used one word that begins with sh. And then after a while, he graduated into a word that begins with f. Oh, I was just, you know. When I was, you know, when I was in the school, the, the little kids, the first graders would come up to me and they'd, they'd tell me to bend right over. And I'd bend over and they'd say, a big Tommy in the eighth grade said the fuck word. <gasps> Such a bad word to be saying, you know. And this man was using the fuck word in sentences. <laughs> he, was, he was using it in all parts of speech, like a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb, a preposition, a conjunction. He was using it with ed on the end, with ing at the end, with er on the end. And I recall that on one occasion he used it with the word mother before it. And I said, and this is going to be my spiritual leader for the rest of my life. Oh, you know, I came into this deal with so much arrogance and so much knowing it all and so much, you know, that he, oh, it was awful. But what I remember, I got in the car to go home and... I was crying really hard because I didn't want to be there and I didn't want to be an alcoholic. Oh, God, it was awful. I was crying on the way home and at the stop sign I looked at myself in the mirror and this green eye makeup that I put on my face, coming down my face, and I said the shit word and the shit word all the way home to the convent. Oh, I did not want to be an alcoholic. Now... I know. I, I just know there's a whole bunch of you out there, and the minute you surrendered, you did surrender forever. I was not a surrenderer. And for those of you who battle with this deal, you know, and, and continue to battle with it, you're my favorite people. I'm the kicker, screamer, scratcher, fighter, anything. You know, don't, don't tell me what to do. I have this Irish arrogance that tells me I already know, thank you very much. And, <laughs> Oh, it was very difficult for me. It was so hard for me. Uh, you know, out of, out of people in my line of work, according to the statistics, there's about 15% of us who are allegedly alcoholic or chemically dependent in some way. And the statistics say that less than 1% of us is getting any kind of help. And as I stand before you today, I recall what I read, uh, reread a couple of months ago in my journal that I, I wrote in December of 1978, which is the year I got sober. And this is what it said. It was a God letter. It said, Dear God, I think it is coming to the inevitable that I would have to give up alcohol and that I'm an alcoholic. Please do not let this happen to me. <laughs> and I have it underscored, you know. And I've written that for at least five or six days. Please do not let this happen to me. As I stand in this holy spot today, in this holy, holy spot today, I want to, in your presence, Thank my God, thank my Creator that he or she did not hear my prayer because I would never have had the privilege of being with you like I am today. God knew what was best for me and God knew that this was the path I was supposed to go and I did not want to go there. 
as I continue going to these, these meetings, listening to the vocabulary increasing, you know, and all of this that was happening, I was basically hearing a few things, and there, there were strange things to me, like, don't drink. God, in December, don't drink if you live in a convent. That's like a death sentence, I want you to know. Because Christmas was one of the kind of legal times where nobody would be counting, nobody would be watching. And it would be, and, and you know, people used to give us champagne and liqueurs for Christmas. So the little nunny bunnies would like a little drinky poor Christmas. And this one especially did. And um, it was just, oh, don't drink, they were saying. And don't use any mind-altering drugs. Now, I wasn't really involved with drugs as there are drugs today, but I did have open prescriptions for Elevil, Stelazine, Librium, and Valium. <laughs> <laughs> and when I, <laughs> when I sort of swilled those down with a little drop of whatever I could get, you know, uh, they made me feel like the music on Twilight Zone. Na, 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 na. Tony, I think I heard you saying yesterday that they made you slur your words. And I, I think that that was the reason I stopped, you know, I stopped using the, the prescription drugs just on my own because I just didn't like the way they felt. I, alcohol was definitely the drug of my choice. And they were saying, don't drink. Uh, and then I picked up this other thing that were encouraging at these meetings. Go to meetings. Well, because of my arrogance and my not wanting to be there and not listening to the shit word and the fuck word regularly and all of that and the smoker. The, the, you know, you people in 1978 were not my sort. You know, you were not my sort. And to think that my whole life is involved with you now, every piece of my life is involved with you now, what a miracle. And uh, they were saying, go to meetings. And, and uh, then they said, uh, read the book, read, read the big book. I took the big book and I read it from cover to cover because I knew if I could read it and apply it, then I wouldn't have to be going to these meetings I could find out. But what I did was I read the book, and I'm an English major from the University of London, and I discovered that the book was not that well written. The, the, you know, excuse me for those of you who are... You know, the, the syntax is just... A, it, it requires a little bit of work here and there, you know. And um, so what I did was I took it down to Huntington Beach, and I sat down there. In fact, what I did was I sat up where the lifeguards go again, disobedient, you know, not doing, I'm not supposed to sit up there, but I did. And I corrected the big book. And um, I, I put in parentheses and commas, and, you know, I, I structured the sentences so that it could be read, you know, by you. And um, I brought it down to Serenity Hall in Whittier, and I told them this. I didn't have any more sense than not to tell them this. And I told them, and. And they said, keep coming back, B. <laughs> and uh, then they were talking about sponsorship. And in the early years of my sobriety, I did poorly with sponsors. I, what I did was I interviewed women. And I took them on for a while, and then I let them go. And, you know, I just, I, I just couldn't do this. I, I, I couldn't get it for the longest time. It was very difficult for me to do this thing that we have to do, which is let go and surrender. I, I, I just thought there was a way that somehow I could do this thing by myself or, or, or that there was a kind of a holy way that I could do this without being, having to go to meetings for God's sake and having to read this stuff or, and listen to, really, have you seen a person feel this? Thirdly, far, 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 over and over. And God, these people think I'm a moron. You know, I mean, this is just too simplistic for me. And then they talked about the steps and, um, you know, uh, these were always draped on the walls everywhere I went. I think, well, you know, I've done all that sort of stuff. I See, I had all this information about God in here between my ears. I'd done all this study, all this praying, all this reading, all, this, all these retreats I made, all these courses. And I had what I call these days, now I call it, I had an arrangement with God. And an arrangement is when you make a kind of a little pact. He said, I'll do this for you if you do that for me. And uh, I was kind of living like that with this arrangement. And uh, I had no clue, no clue whatsoever as to what it was to have a relationship with a higher power. By the grace of my higher power, 
and the beauty and the goodness and the unconditional loving of people in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was presented to a God with skin on to the people. And I was to learn in a way that I had never dreamt of what it was to have a relationship with my higher power. And I learned that from the love that I was given by people like Marilyn and Judy and continues through Sherry and different people here and Wade, wonderful, wonderful people who continue to love me and to show me the unconditionality of God's love for me. And I was to learn that through the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. What a tremendous miracle. But I didn't get that for the longest time, so I was going to Serenity Hall. I was crying at every single meeting. In fact, in Serenity Hall, they told me later that they used to call me the crying nun. <laughs> I was sick and I'd snivel, and I cried from frustration and from fear, from not wanting to, from, isn't there another way I can do this? Isn't there something, isn't there something that I could get? not to have to do it this way. And uh, an older member of the program came over to me in Serenity Hall one day and he said to me, you know, we've noticed, B, that you're always miserable. And he opened up the book to page 133. And he said, we are, it, it said there on, on that line, we are sure that God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. And then on the page before that, on page 132, he showed me where it says, we absolutely insist on enjoying life. And I sat him down and I gave him an earful for 25 minutes. And I told him that if this deal called Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps was psychologically unsound, it was theologically unsound, that there were all kinds of reasons why somebody like me, in my line of work, and my caliber, you know, could never do this the way that you guys were wanting it to be done. And he nodded his head for the 25 minutes, and he listened to me, and he was very kind and very patient. And he also pointed out to me on page 63, the third step prayer, and he said, uh, some, it, said some, it says there at the bottom of the third step prayer that, you know, we took a while to make sure that we were ready so that we could have at last abandoned ourselves utterly to him. These superlative words in, in that chapter are mind-boggling to me. So, he said, you know, I could tell you something that might be helpful to you. Why don't you go home and kneel down in your convent and ask God to give you the willingness to change everything about you? Now, you know, I mean, that was a little simplistic for me. <laughs> but, you know, something else, if you're in such emotional pain, Sometimes you'll try anything. And I was in deep emotional pain. And uh, I went home and I, in a very awkward, embarrassed sort of fashion, I did exactly as he told me. And of course I expected that I would see a burning bush and that there would be a rainbow in the sky and I would see God face to face or something. And nothing happened of great significance at that moment. Except that a couple of days later, I was driving on the 57 freeway in deep traffic. I was scared to death to drive on the freeway. And I noticed the sunset in the rearview mirror. And it occurred to me that I hadn't thought of a drink for a couple of days. Because all of the months that I was struggling and didn't want to and was trying to figure this whole thing out, I was dying to drink, but I was going to show those people that I could stay from drinking. And uh, it occurred to me that I hadn't thought of a drink for a couple of days. And at that instant, on the 57 freeway, in deep traffic, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the merciless obsession, as it is described in the 12 and 12 and the first step, had been removed from me. I knew that that monkey on my back, that thing that was just choking me, was, was being relieved. And I started to get really excited about the program. And I started trying to move into the solution instead of staying in the problem. 
And I, I offer that to you, and I always like the opportunity to say it, that any of you here who might be stuck in sobriety, or as somebody said to me once, in between surrenders. <laughs> if you find yourself there, to pray for the willingness to make that movement is a great, it's a wonderful prayer. And it's a prayer that God always answers, always I think the day that I prayed for the willingness, God said to me, B, I thought you'd never ask. And here's enough willingness, a day at a time, to do whatever it is you need to do. And I just became extremely excited about this deal. And what I learned in learning about the solution was, and uh, this is what happened for me now, was I learned that my basic problem is very specifically outlined on page 62. Self, selfishness, self-centeredness. It's all about me. You know, it's mentioned 13 times. And as we say in Texas, it's a sign. That it, <laughs> that it might be our problem. It's always exciting to me where it says, you know, and I've, I've, I've had to do this in order to read it so that I'll take it in. Otherwise, I think it's just for you. It says at the last paragraph there on, on page 62, B, this is the how and the why of it. You have to quit playing God because it doesn't work. Hereafter, in this drama of life, God is going to be your director. He's the father, you're his child etc etc and most good ideas are simple B they're so simple that you would probably miss it but this concept that God's in charge is the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which you're going to walk to freedom now that's all I ever wanted was that inside freedom where I could feel okay like I am right now in my own skin with unresolved problems that it's okay that everything is going to be okay and it has always been fascinating and interesting to me God help me you know for correcting that big book because it's marvelous just the way it was written it's wonderful because what it does is it gives me the, the, the 13 references to my problem and then it gives me 13 promises immediately afterwards it says that uh, all sorts of remarkable things will happen for you, B, if you sincerely take this position, if you, if, you, if you really make up your mind to do this. Because now you're going to have a new employer, and you're going to become less and less interested in yourself and your own little plans and designs, and you're going to become more interested in what you can contribute to life. And you're going to enjoy peace of mind, and you, B, you are going to discover that you can face life successfully and eventually be, you will be reborn. What a gift. So what happened for me was that I got extremely excited about the promises. Marilyn will remember the first Christmas day that, um, that I was uh, sober. I went to a woman's meeting, and the church that we normally have the meeting in was not open, so we had to have the meeting in Marilyn's car. And we sat there in the car, and I remember we read the promises, Marilyn, and, uh, you, know, we're going to know, the ones we usually read at meetings, we're going to know new freedom and new happiness. And I, as they were being read, I said, when? We will not regret the past or wish to shut the eye to say to myself, when? We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace, when? No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will, when? We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, when? We will intuitively know how to handle situations just about when, when, God, when are we going to know any of this? Eventually, I was to become very excited about the promises. And not only those promises on 83 and 84, but all the promises that are caught into the steps. So that's what happened. I got extremely excited. And then, as many of you here know, thanks be to God, Many of you here know that 15 years ago, I um, started an entirely different ministry from the one I was in, with the blessings of all my superiors, to carry the message of the promises and the steps all over the world. 
and uh, what I do is I go from place to place all over the world presenting workshops and retreats and all of that and um, just my life is so full and so incredible and in the meantime of all of that too was had the privilege and the the wonderful joy of developing and creating St. Clair's Garden, which many of you have been to, and which my good friend Jim T. <laughs> Jim, I often wonder what you thought in those days ten years ago when Jim built the fence at St. Clair's Garden. Let's give him a hand for that. <laughs> Thank you. Because, you know, at times I don't have the, the capacity to know What's the difference between being passionate about what God's will is for me or Seth will run riot? Do you know the difference? If you do, you might want to tell me. I don't know sometimes. But I do know that we drank lots of good, strong black coffee and that fence was built beautifully. And uh, I've gotten to, to, to have such joy in life. What's happening for me today, ladies and gentlemen, is that I'm in deep grief. My brother is dying in Ireland, and um, he's been battling cancer for the last five years. Um, We got word a couple of weeks ago that uh, they could no longer do anything for him. And he's our only brother, and I love him deeply. But I do know that the arms and the hands of Alcoholics Anonymous have been stretched to me all through this whole procedure. And when I called Dee Dee and told her that it might not, I might not be able to be here, she just said, well, I'm going to trust, you know, and see what, what will happen. I called home the other day and um, expecting his wife to answer. And he answered in a very weak voice, and I said to him, Charles, I'm going to Hawaii, and um, I don't know, I don't want to be too far away. And he said, listen, life is for the living. Go and do God's work. And so I know, I knew for sure, I, I was another sign and I was given, and I knew for sure that God wanted me to be here to share with you whatever experience, strength, and hope that I would have to give you. I ask for your prayers for our family. Um, he was the only boy uh, in this family in the middle of us all and has been father and mother and everything to us for years and years. And we've loved him and um, his family loves him. His wife of 35 years said to me last week when I was back there, she said, I hope you know that your brother is the kindest man that ever walked this earth. And I know that, and it's, it's difficult to, um, to let this go and to know that this is all part of living. His, his living and dying has been such an inspiration to me. But my sponsor has told me that it's real important for me to continue to share with you exactly where I'm at. So where I'm having great moments of deep joy and exhilaration, like my friend Judy A and I danced the other day at the dance workshop. You know, we had a wonderful time together. And we had a wonderful, that was a wonderful workshop. And I appreciated being here and, and, and just receiving from you and, and reaching out to you and loving you. At the same time, I need, you to t- I need to tell you that my heart is breaking at the loss of my brother. You know, I don't really know how this deal works, but because of encountering step seven, I was able then to experience this, as I mentioned earlier, this unconditional love of a higher power. And as we prayed this morning, Anne and John and myself prayed, and we said the seventh step prayer, and, you know, my creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I finally knew that I never had to be good for God anymore. What a gift. What a relief. I never had to pretend. I never had to, you know, we don't have to. That nothing I can do can take God's love away from me or you. Nothing. That God is crazy about us. And as our friend, our other friend Judy, who passed away in in June of this year, she, she sent me this email. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. 
you know, the preciousness. And when I got to this step seven, I then knew what I used to teach other people. You know, your God loves you so much that he would carve your name on the palm of his hands, or your God loves you so much that he would store up your tears and put them into a little bottle. Can you imagine a God who cares for us so much, no matter where we've been, what we've done, whatever has happened for us, that we are so precious to this God? And I think through the wonderful mystery of the steps and the gift that we've been given, we get to realize that on a daily, daily basis, that that we're so precious. I never know how this deal works. I really don't, even though we read it out from chapter 5. I just don't understand the mystery of it. Because when I think I have it all figured out, then I learn a new secret, you know. There's a whole new thing that I didn't know about before. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, so there is one who has all power. And think, oh, yeah. Now, where have I been all this time when step five has been read, you know? Or letting go absolutely, or abandon myself utterly, or, you know, just new things are coming to me all the time as I, as I become conscious and aware and willing to do the work, willing to do the deep down work to be able to find this higher power deep down within, as our book tells us. This is where you find God. I just didn't think it would be too classy to go deep down within to find God. I thought you had to find God in church or out there or something. I didn't know it was getting down in through all my character defects and all of the causes and conditions. I had no clue about any of that. So now I know that I find the great reality deep down within and when I continue to do the work that that's where I I will find this God. The mystery of it baffles me. And as I close, I just think of um, I think of a line from from Shakespeare's play King Lear, and he's just about to be thrown into prison with his daughter, and he says something like this: "And we shall laugh, and we shall pray, and we shall sing, and tell old tales of who's in and who's out, and look at gilded butterflies, and take upon us the mystery of things." as though we were God's spies. And I believe in Alcoholics Anonymous and in all of the 12-step programs, we get on a daily basis to take upon ourselves the mystery of things. We don't know how God works, when God works, if God works, how God works. And so therefore, we have to give tremendous belief and credence to our code that love and tolerance of others is our code and we don't know, we don't know we cease fighting, we do all the letting go that we need to do to let God's work happen I'm awfully awfully grateful to you Dee Dee for letting me be part of you here today and for allowing me into your lives as you have I want to ask God's blessing on all of you as you go to your respective homes. And I know that we will meet one another again as we trudge this road to happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.